Welcome again to Cottage Talk. This is our post-match of Holmes nil-nil draw against Crystal Palace at Selhurst Park. Joining me is Max Cohen in the bottom square. In the right-hand square is Mike Gregg being, coming back on the show. Also, Mike is actually a very good contributor to the Fofcast. I also want to mention the Fofcast. They do a great job as well. So it's good to have Mike on this show as well. Guys, let's not waste any time. Max, I'm going to go to you first. Let's talk about this nil-nil draw. I'm going to ask you the basic question. I've done this before. Let's do it again. Max, <laughs> mad or optimist Max coming out of this match? Yeah, I mean, there's really only one way to put it, and it's it's two points dropped. Simple as that. So, I said that on the full-time show. Yeah, I don't know if I go as far as, as to say mad, um, but I'm definitely upset. I'm not optimistic uh, about this. You know, we, should, we, have to win, we have to win that match if we want to stay in the league. And I know I've said that in many, many opportunities this season after yeah. the West Brom match, Brighton match, and, you know, we found ourselves back in it. But it, it's the same way that, you know, we drew the West Brom match, but then we go and win against Everton, like an unexpected three points. The same situation in, in the next three matches, you know, are we going to get two draws, you know, against Spurs and Liverpool, maybe sneak a win, but it just makes it so we have to overperform against the big teams. That being said, we haven't played poorly against the big teams. I was going to say, we season. played pretty well against them. But the big getting teams. a win against them is a different story. So the main frustration here is that we didn't convert the chances. I think Magia is guilty of missing two really big ones. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is Cavalero. I think made a big impact off the bench. I agree. Finding, I think, his best place for him is playing on the wing and coming off you know, the first for the final 20 minutes. That's a good role for him. And in addition, I think the Parker substitution to take off Angus and put on Mitrovic actually didn't have the intended effect. Well, we're going to talk about later. that because I want to get both you and Mike's thoughts on that when we talk about the second I, half. I think we completely lost the midfield in that situation okay, and that's... lost our groove. But again, main takeaway is Palace showed absolutely no ambition to win the game. We're the only team in it. And to come across, to come away with it with only one point is not disgraceful, but you know it's going to give us a big mountain to climb again. Okay, so your biggest takeaway from the match is simply two points dropped. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Mike, over to you. We were talking off air. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to spend some time talking about this nil-nil draw, but let's just, you know, kind of limit it. Because, and just want to mention to everyone watching live, just uh, stick around with us because the second half of the show I think is going to be fun. We're going to be doing something very interesting in the second half of the show. So just want to mention that. Mike, give me your opening thoughts on this nil-nil draw. Uh, well, it really was dull, wasn't it? I mean, uh, I don't know what you saw in America, but at halftime – on the BBC here, they were actually talking about uh, Line of Duty. which I heard about that. So, um, yeah, the first half was pretty dire, wasn't it? Uh, second half uh, was a lot better. But in the end, I've, I've got to agree with Max, you know, it's, it's two points dropped. And, yep. you know, there's a lot of games recently against the teams at the bottom where we're not losing, you know, but we're, but we're not beating them either. So we're not picking up the points, which would make this run in a lot easier. And... Um, so, you know, to go to Palace, I mean, we haven't done very well there in pre- previous years. And for a home team, they were very, very poor. And Very uh, poor, Mike. You know, I know Palace fans aren't happy with Rory. And, you know, and you have to say, if I was watching that, I'd be very, very disappointed as a Palace fan. But, you know, we should have won. You know, it came away from it. It's definitely two points dropped. And yep. uh, uh, there was only one, I think I tweeted or something, there was only one team that was going to win it and that would have been us. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, they woke up for the last five minutes, I think. But, uh, you know, I think that was partly our own undoing, which gave them some chances. So, yeah, it's uh, disappointing. Yeah, you come away Sunday, yeah, we we, we should have won. We should have won. And, absolutely, uh, it's, Mike. It's the story of the season. You know, tight, and, uh, but just can't, create can't create good enough chances it's all right having 10 12 13 shots whatever it is but it's creating the chances and i think seeing seeing magic since he's joined you know we saw those goals against everton right great and and that's what you know he's played five games now he's got two goals but you know he, he was a little bit more involved on sunday but he his whole career for us is going to be whether we can get the ball to him in that sort of eight yards from goal. See, I totally point. agree, Mike. Yeah. So it just it just showed that we're not creating enough. So is that down to who we have on the pitch? 
you know, we might talk about it later, but I think it just, you know, not having KME, who is clearly the best creator or best passer that we have in the squad, I would say. Um, and it, uh, it just shines a light on how much we're missing a player like that, if yep. not the same player himself. Well, what's interesting, Mike, and uh, I don't know if you saw Gordon and Rob's show with us, but Gordon was, you know, again, talking as a striker, that uh, the striker, you know, Maja or Mitro, just not getting the service, Mike. Do you think it starts with not having Kearney, or is it also a, a bigger issue a wide? Because why are they not getting enough crosses and action into that box? Well, I mean, it's you know, there's, there's two types of things there. So if you've got Mitrovic playing, he wasn't getting good enough crosses to him to have enough chances. And then with Maja, when apart from the Everton game, we're not going to the byline again. Right. Or, or, or playing the balls through like that, so so it's a it's a question of down to formation. It's a question of quality as well. You know, Robinson. We all like Robinson, yeah. We all yep. like the way he tacks down that wing, and that's why he was brought on at half time. But let's be honest, his final ball needs to be better, doesn't it? Oh, totally so, agree, Mike. Totally agree. Um, he's very much Fredericks like in the first <laughs> couple of season and a half. Fredericks was with us, you know. Bomb down that wing and, whoa, yeah, there goes the ball into the Hammersmith end. But Frederick's but, um, had, had better he crossing, better. Mike. He got better yeah. and, you know, yeah. and we saw that at the height of the Ikanovic uh, sort of team as well, didn't we? So, yeah, um, yeah it is just creating good quality chances. That's the issue for me. I, I totally agree, Mike, because, again, it's very – interesting to watch them because I can see it. It's just, it's re- really like they just cannot put it all together. It just doesn't seem to all work in unison. And uh, I think, you know, again, if, if that's ho- going to be how it's going to be, you know, it's, it really will come down to scoring goals because we can see that we are going to be tough to beat defensively. Now it really is another big part of the, of the game, which is actually scoring the goals. And, and as you said, Mike, it's a very good point. Well, creating the opportunities. Yeah, well, there's a little bit of a rule of thumb. It doesn't quite work, but for every goal you score, you you roughly get a point. If you look at a league table, it pretty much works out like that. And we've scored, yep. what, 21 goals, got 23 points. Yeah. And, you know, it, We're not scoring enough. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It's a simple game. We're not scoring enough. We, we are stopping teams from scoring themselves. But, again, there's there's two parts to the game, and we're not scoring enough goals. It's great. Point. All right. All right, guys. Let's just talk about the starting 11. Let's get there right now. Max, your thoughts on the starting 11. Were you happy with the starting 11? It was the starting 11, I think. I, I don't think Nguisa started at, at Everton. I would have to rethink that a little bit. Maybe, maybe you have the answer to that, but it's it seems similar to the Everton game. Yeah, I think uh, it was Reed and Lamina against That's Everton, what I think. Right. Nguisa came in uh, this match, and then uh, different from the previous match we played against Sheffield United, I think it was Tete and Ina to start. Okay. Um, rather than you know Tete dropped out against Sheffield United. Other than that, I think you know Cavalera dropped to the bench in favor of Decade over Reed. Didn't really have an issue with that. And I think it, that's what we saw there was probably one of our strongest. Uh, At the 11s. time, what were you thinking? Because I I actually liked the lineup. Yeah, I liked it. I think Reed and Ngisa is a good combination. I think those are probably our two strongest central midfielders. Um, and then you know Mitrich back on the bench was big. Uh, still don't know how Parker, or if you will, try to fit both Mitra and Madja in the same starting 11. But this seems to me like a, like a good starting 11. You know, back four again is what we've called for. Sticking yep. with that was a positive sign. Okay. Mike, what were your thoughts an hour before the match? Did you like the lineup or were you thinking, you know, and, and again, I was actually a little bit surprised that Robinson was back in. Robinson was not in. I'm sorry, it was Aina. Um, I thought Robinson would start. So, what were your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, first thing I look for is, you know, is Mitrovic or Kenny in the squad. Mitrovic <laughs> was back, so I was happy with that. Um, but really, we pretty much know nine of those stars. It's just whether is Tete going to be on the right? Is Aina yep. going to be there? You know, um, Reed is he going to start? Um, I was glad Angrisa was back. Lamina, uh, probably out of all the loans, is the one of the question marks. What's he actually bringing? I do actually, I think I may have mentioned on last show, I was on, you know, I think we're going to play the big team soon. Right. Again. You know, I think there is an argument for Reed and Greaser and maybe Lamina starting the game. You know, that would pack the midfield type thing. But um, no, I was, I, 
you looked at the lineup and you sort of went, yeah, okay, nice to see uh, Bobby Reed sort of starting. Um, but he had a question on the left back, but then Aina did well, you know, before. So it's uh, it doesn't quite pick itself, but, you know, if if you had three stabs at picking a lineup, I wouldn't be surprised if you picked that one. Okay. You know, he's, he's pretty predictable on the way he, he goes at the moment. Okay, very good. All right. All right, guys, we're going to spend very little time talking about the first half because, really, there is not much to talk about the first half. But over to you, Max. I, I just want to get your analysis of the first half because, again, it just looked like two teams that really didn't want to do too much to, you know, again, it just seemed very conservative on, on both sides, including Fulham. They Again, they were not taking many chances. As uh, I believe Scott Parker even said, they were huffing and puffing, but they really were not creating much. So just give me your overall analysis of the first half. The one thing that I that I do want to mention, really the only opportunity that you can really talk about from Crystal Palace actually came from Anderson touching it back to Areola, and that was in, in the 27th minute. Now you do have a couple of headers from Anderson in the first half, and, the, and that was actually not, not so bad. But beyond that, really, what is there really to talk about with, with the first half? What were you thinking watching it? It was very cagey. I think that's the best way to describe it. And let's not, you know, pass off all the responsibility from Palace here because I think they abdicated any responsibility they had to make this, you know, a two-sided football match. You know, when you're the home side, you're expected to attack, expected to take the team, take the match to their team. They did nothing. I think that is a very big part of why this match was so poor from a neutral standpoint. Yep. Also from our standpoint. You know, we possess a lot of the ball, but as soon as we they're very happy to sit off us until we got near their 18 yard box. And then they start to press and they start to, you know, make us uncomfortable. So, so much of the match was played just outside of the danger areas. Yep. And you mentioned we did have a number of set pieces. We did. We dominated the corner game, but that's been consistent all year is that we struggled to score goals from corners. I still think um, that own goal, uh, we had the two own goals, right? The, the Ina goal against Burnley and then the own goal, Richie against Newcastle. Those owns I can think of that we scored off yep. set pieces and they were both very fortunate. Which is not a very good team at heading the ball uh, without Mitrovic in there. And I think Anderson probably could have done a bit better in one of those headers, but you're right. No really main chances. And that's a bit disappointing um, because Palace were there, were there for the taking. Absolutely. We knew they were going to attack. They're missing Zaha. You know, it's, it's without him, they're not the same side. Everyone knows that. And they just feel like a, like a wasted opportunity, very similar to how I thought at halftime against Sheffield United. You know, we just thrown away 45 minutes. Um, of football and once you depend on a goal a late goal in that second half you're always gonna be gambling you're always gonna be wondering what would happen if we had 10 more minutes and again uh, you can also think of the west ham united match recently when yep. we had so much pressure in the final t- 10 minutes what happens if that pressure starts earlier what happens if you know we put that kind of pressure on the first half uh, and, and i think you know towards may if we're still in this or if we're out of it we'll look back and say why didn't we attack this more okay very good Mike, over to you. You know, as I mentioned, there were a couple of opportunities from set pieces from Anderson, but beyond that, really, it was just. And I watched a, an interview with with Anderson, and he was talking about it that you know, again, they were they weren't really creating enough. I'm paraphrasing from the interview, but they were, you know, and again, it just like looked like two teams, like Max said, KG. And uh, do you think, you know, I said this to Emilio, and I'm curious your your view on this as well. Do you think this is partially by design? I hate to say it this way, that I know Parker wants him to be more brave, but the, does he also win still? Let's get to halftime at least nil-nil or ahead by a goal. Maybe we nick a goal. It's it's almost like they won't. They're unwilling to take a lot of chances in the first half. I I think I've seen consistency with this with Parker's teams. What is your view on that? Because obviously we have changes at halftime. We'll talk about it. Do you think part of this is? on the players, and part of this might be on Parker. Well, I think it's a, it's a mentality thing, isn't it? I mean, if Right, that's what I mean, right. You know, if, it, if it's drilled into you from early on in the season, it's quite difficult for, che- for teams to suddenly change gear, you know, and, uh, you know, go from a... I wouldn't say we're ever ultra-defensive, but certainly, you know, we're trying to be more solid. And, you know, you've got the four defenders, you've got Reed um, and Greaser gets a little bit forward, but I... I think it's very much weighted when you look at the way we attack. 
you know, if one side's attacking, the other side sort of tends to hold back. Right. So it's always about having four or six back. And I, because I, I still think we don't get enough bodies in the box. Totally you know? agree, Mike. So you, you watch other teams who play against this and you'll think, why have they got two or three people in the box when they're attacking? And we yep. only ever seem to have one. That's right, Mike. Maybe two. We don't have the run. So we don't have Anguisa, Reed, or Loftus Creek, either of those three midf- central midfielders, if you like. Um, getting into the box when you've got Reed and Lookman down the other side. And I, I think it's also a case of, you know, we have the speculative sort of shots from outside the box, Lookman are cut in or yep. Reed or Cavalero when he came on as well. But what we're not, they're not gambling enough for me. They're not gambling enough at, at trying the one twos in the box or even running into the box, you know, to try and get fouled for Christ's sake or something. So I'm not gambling in that sense. Um, so it's, I think I think it is just a situation where we've got ourselves solid, and that is just the way we play. But you've also got to remember Palace, as as Max says, Palace was so negative, so solid. They were, you know, it was almost like they were playing. You know, eight of you can't get over the halfway line. It was like I don't know the hockey rules too much, but I know. It's, <laughs> All about you kind of certain players in zones, yeah. and it was almost okay, like Mike. that. And but that's Roy, you know, because yeah. Roy works like that. And and we go back to the great escape, and that's how he built that team. But when you've got a, a team with a centre back like Cahill, who is, let's be honest, over the hill, yep, we should be causing them a lot more problems, and we should have been much more positive in a game that we should have won uh, or, yep. or needed to win. So the first half. Yeah, it was really dull, dull, dull. Okay. All right. Well, let's transition to the second half. But we have to talk about what happened at the beginning of the second half, the changes. Now, what's interesting here is, um, Max, I'll I'll start with you. I want to talk about Robinson coming on because the broadcast that we heard, the international broadcast, they made it sound like they believed that this was injury-related. As we find out after the match, and I said this on full-time, that was not the case. Parker said that this was tactical, that he wanted Robinson in there to to be more offensive, basically. So, what were your thoughts when when he came on? Do you did you see what he was going to try to do? Because again, I'm going to talk about with Mike in just a second the formation change, which I learned from the Anderson interview because he they changed the formation, but part of it was bringing Robinson. What was your thoughts when you saw this? Because, again, we heard that it was injury-related, and it turned not to be. This was tactical. Yeah, I think I can see the justification behind it in terms of, you know, Robinson, a natural left footer on the left-back position where, you know, we've mainly seen play on the right. So it was a bit out of position for him. Although, you know, one of the best matches we've played all season, the Everton match, had Aina on that left-back position. So don't know what to make of that, honestly. But I like it because you look at the wingers, Lookman, predominantly right footed he's always looking to cut in yep and you know you have lost his cheek on the right he's always looking essentially to he's playing quite centrally because he's more of a central player as mike was saying it's not a lot of width in the team a lot of crosses and that puts a lot no. of pressure on those fullbacks and if you want a fullback whipping crosses you prefer the one who's you know on his dominant foot that being said robinson as we discussed his delivery is lacking it's, yeah, it's still a bit poor so that's kind of a counter argument to that but i do think he offered that pace and there were a number of runs he had that came surging forward to help out Lookman. So I think it made a, a bit of a difference. Okay. All right. Good. And Mike, over to you, because again, we're talking about the changes at halftime. When I watched the Anderson interview, which you can watch on fullmfc.com, Anderson talks about the, the formation change that they went to four, three, three. And uh, that was also intended to get more players in the box. We, you know, we're talking about getting players in the box. So what did you make about the changes? You know, we'll, we'll analyze the first half was this again i mentioned to you that this to me was parker making ch- you know again i want wanted to make tactical changes but he waited until halftime to do it in the second half he does this what were your thoughts about changing the formation now we le- learned that it was more of a 4-3-3 and uh i want to say it probably helped ruben loftus cheek get more involved um yeah i mean i i I did watch that interview and I, I didn't see it, I have to say. And when you look at the, the stats for the second half, you can see the positional stats. Yeah. 
there is no change really. Oh. Yes, Loftus Creek maybe slightly goes a bit more central, but um, he seemed I mean, to go thought, deeper yeah. too, Mike. Yeah, first off he was going all the way across, but actually, you know, Robinson coming on didn't make much of much of a difference, sort of positional wise. So okay, it may have intended to go to four three three, but it, <laughs> to me it didn't work out. May have a little bit more when Cavallero came on. Yes. Um, yeah, Robinson, I can understand why, he, because we weren't creating enough chances, we weren't penetrating them enough, and you want to put a natural left footer on there anyway. So so that made sense, and, you know, and it, it's a decent sub. But, uh, but, I mean, it made a change. You know, we had much more impetus in the second half, and we, and we definitely went for it more. So even if I couldn't see the tactical change he was trying to oh. make, you certainly saw... A, a little change in the mentality and a bit right. more urgency. And again, that maybe goes down to Palace as well, who, you know, an older team, you know, so they're going to tire a little bit more. And we, there was moments there where we were quite relentless. You know, we had the ball for, for long periods of the game. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, so so we went for it in that sense of, sense of the word. And, and you know, um, maybe a little bit earlier, talk about the other subs, but... Um, yes. Yeah, the Robinson one, yeah, made sense to me. Um, what I found interesting was actually that he, he didn't take Tete off and he didn't put Aino over on the right, you know, because he's done that a couple of times. He has. And so maybe Tete is now, you know, winning that sort of right back position. Interesting. Very interesting stuff. Okay. All right. I'm going to mention some key moments and then, Max, I'll go back over to you. So, again, um, the match in the second half begins with, you know, a questionable, you know, I mentioned this, that, that again, you know, you can look at this a couple of different ways. The shot by Maja, many people see as a waste. And in the end, it is a waste. But I also thought, you know what, why not? You know, maybe it shows a little bit of intent that, hey, we're going to take take the second half a little bit differently. And that, you know, from that point on, 51st minute, you have the header from Tosin off of a free kick. 54th minute, shot from Anderson. 55th minute, free kick. Anderson's free kick just goes wide. And then in the 66th minute, you have the shot by Manja that just goes wide. Cavalero comes on from, from, for Bobby Decadova Reed at that point. And Mike, very good by you. I, I could see a, a change there when, when Cav comes on. But let's talk about this, Max, over to you. Because, um, Josh Manja, you know, scores two goals. And this was a very good opportunity I'm talking about in the 68th minute, the header and actually set up from Cavalero. So, Cavalero's substitution paid off from the get-go. So thoughts on this opportunity? Should he have scored here? Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Um, I think, you know, we give Cavalero a lot of stick for his poor finishing when he was playing striker. That was a great cross. Um, I think we, we deserve to give him credit for the cross, but also criticize Magia because that's he got in front of the defender. He's, what, six, seven yards out from goal. And any, anywhere to the left or right of the keeper, that's in. Guaita makes a good save, to be fair, because it's not directly at him, but it needs to be in the corners. It needs to be a, a different height rather than the comfortable height for the keeper to save. And yeah, when, when you get a striker in the January window and you put a lot of pressure on them, they have to make, a very, make the most out of every single opportunity. So that, that, that's a tough one to take um, because it's, it's a poor finish. And again, it's a larger issue. When we're on top in matches, as that chance came in the middle of that kind of 15 to 20 minute spell of yep. really good pressure... Yep. We couldn't capitalize. So again, you know, I really like Magia. Of course, I love what he did in his first start uh, at Goodison. Um, but again, the, the recruitment, you have, to have, you have to point fingers at that. Again, in the attacking department, if, if you want to stay in the league, you need better quality um, up top. And I think Magia started that one. I really want him to do well, but it's a bit unfair to expect him to keep us up single-handedly, you know, because he's not that oh, kind I of player. I agree with that, yeah. And I think... It's not his fault. I'm, I'm definitely annoyed at him. He missed a chance, but you have to look up higher up the club and say, where have the striking, re- the striking reinforcers come? Why have they come so late? And honestly, Magia is, is not going to be that guy in my opinion. I want him to be, but you know, he played what a couple half, one and a half seasons in Liga, played really well in League One in England. Uh, I don't think he ever made a Premier League appearance before he came to us in January. That's not that's not the guy that's going to get you 10, 10 goals in the second half season and go in a great run of scoring form. And again, I think a better striker scores that chance. As simple as that. Okay. Mike, your thoughts on the opportunity for Maja? 
yeah, I mean, it's um, you've got to take your chances. That's the, that's the difference in this league, isn't it? That's the difference in quality. You know, we, we said earlier in the show that it's about giving him a chance. He gets that chance. He doesn't take it. OK, yep. it's harsh on him, you know, uh, if you're going to be critical. But, you know, he's that kind of player. He's, the, you know, fox in the box, all that kind of stuff. Right. But he's not going to give you much more outside it, is he, really? We've seen that. No, it's inside. You know, yeah. you know he... If, if he's not scoring, then he's not doing an awful lot else, really, than what I'm seeing. And, you know, there's lots of people getting carried away when he scored those two goals and, and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, he's, a, he's clearly a decent striker. You can see that from his runs, yep. you know, where he's trying to make space. And, and the players have got to find him when he does that. But um, it's uh, just like you had Ivor on the, the show the other day, you know, um, you know, he gave him the ball, he put the ball in the net, you know, maybe a different level, but, right. you know, outside, I think even Gordon would agree that, you know, he wasn't that involved. And when he, I think it was at Chelsea, he ended up playing on the wing, you know, so, and he's a striker, we have to give him chances. When those chances come along, he's got to take him and he can make a name for himself. He didn't the other day. Um, but, as Max says, there's only him and Mitrovic really who have a pedigree of scoring any kind of goals. So they have to, you know, one or both has to be in that starting lineup, and we have to give them chances. So we can only hope next game, if one falls to him, he can take it. Okay, excellent stuff. Okay, moving on. Right after that, you have the opportunity from Anderson to Cahill block. Just unfortunate. It was right there, and you're thinking, Fulham are going to score there, but give credit to Cahill there. And then in the uh, 70th minute, again, there's still a lot of pressure from Fulham. You have the opportunity from Ruben Loftus-Cheek from distance, just goes wide. Again, he's a player that needs a goal. But this is where I want to stop, guys, because, again, we talked about Cavalero coming on. I thought that was an impact. But we talked about this earlier on, so I want to ask you guys both. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Mitro coming on for the final 20 minutes, but Ngisa coming off. How that how that end up going? Because again, I've heard a lot of criticism after the match about this that it just didn't work. Your thoughts? Well, it didn't work in the fact that um, Palace had their best spell in the last ten minutes. So I don't, you know, last five or ten minutes. So we certainly lost some impetus um, for sure. Um, yeah. um, it was positive from Parker, absolutely positive. To you know, for once he was the, the intent, one the game, intent, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to put them both on, which I'm. Or to put Mitrovic on and play the two, two strikers. I, you know, I'm glad to see that. But maybe he should have tweaked it around a little bit more to give it give us a bit more of a chance. You know, um, I did expect him to go to three at the back actually, and put the two up. Top. Oh. You know, there you are. I was a bit surprised. Um, which I, you know, maybe would have been a, a a better move to make. I don't know. But yeah, Anguissa, I was I was surprised that. I wonder if there's something going on there because obviously he's, you know, he's been out of the team for a couple of games. Now yep. he's only played just over an hour again. You know, is he carrying? I'm just wondering. Is, you know, you're not going to take Reed off, are you? Because I mean, no. he's got a little dynamo. Um, so, so yeah, it was a good a good sub in the fact that it was positive, but it didn't have a positive effect on the game. Right. And maybe you know ten. 15 minutes in into, you know, with five minutes left, we'd just run out of steam. And, and that's why we allowed Palace a couple of sort of half chances or for them to get back into it, you know. Um, and again, we didn't really give Mitrovic enough or anything, really. No. no. Um, so, yeah, I would have I would have liked... I, I'm not sure what I would have done. I, I may have taken off Tete and... Um, and gone with three at the back, possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure okay. Yet. Max, your view on this, because Mike brings this up. The intent on the face of it is positive. This is a positive move, move, but I think it also exposed maybe Reed a little bit, you know, because, again, it was just really about him at that point. But how can you fault the intent? You know, and, and I think that's where Mike's going. It didn't work, but the intent was to go for it. Yeah, I agree completely. I think we, I don't want to be too hypocritical here because I was very critical of Parker and the West Ham match for waiting to sub on Mitra and right. Raja. Um, and this on the face of it was a great move in terms of we're chasing the match, get more strikers in the pitch. 
Well, I think there's a more intelligent way to do it than taking off a midfielder because, you know, as people have remarked in the comments and as I said earlier, yep. you lose the midfield in a way. And I think that's mm-hmm. might have explained Palace getting back in the match more. Yep. But in addition, you know, what did we create for Mitch Rich? You know, did we play to his strengths? One yeah. cross I can remember was one of the last kicks of the match, which was a Tete one, really overhit. Yep. I can't really think of any other crosses in the six yard box that he could have had, could have got his head on, could have got a foot on, or could have capitalized from. So if you're going to put on Mitrovic, you have to give him that service, and it wasn't there. So that's what really frustrated me. I might have even maybe taken off Magia, okay, just because he, you know, didn't take his chance and didn't offer that much. Not as like a slight to him, but you still keep the same formation, but you have more of a target man who's perhaps better at heading. But again, it, it was frustrating because it came just as we were in the middle of that period of pressure. And we thought, great, this will lead to more pressure. Right. But as our micro market actually coincided in Palace's best spell of the match, which was quite uh, quite tedious. And you just felt the nil-nil was coming. And, and it's an awful feeling to have that again. Yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, and, and again, to have a clean sheet's a good thing, but another nil-nil draw. And it, listen, Fulham did create a couple more opportunities, but... I thought Crystal Palace were more dangerous after this substitution. And you have the 88th minute, you have Lookman's shot that goes wide. And then you have the header from Tosin in the 90th minute. And then you have the shot from Maja in the 92nd minute. But again, um, it turns out to be a nil-nil draw. I think we're, we all can agree that it's two-point drop. It's unfortunate because I thought it was there for them. So in a way, even though we're going back and talking about the substitution of Ingisa and, and bringing on Mitro, it didn't work. The intent was there to work. So so I, I, I want to give Parker credit. He was going for it. They were going for it. But, uh, I, again, I, I just thought the approach was one thing in the first half, and then it was more aggressive in the second half. I just I would like to see a more aggressive approach throughout the match. But it is what it is, guys. Um, but, listen, let's finish up talking about this match with man of the match. Mike, who's your man of the match? I'm probably going to go for oh, um, Anson, probably. You know, he was the most uh, consistent, he was involved. Uh, free kick was an interesting one. Yep. You know, yeah, could have, could have worked. Yeah, he said, uh, said he's been practicing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> probably Anson then. But yep. I just wanted to mention about Cavalero, actually. Yep. That, um, yeah, let's go back. Let's talk about Cavalero. Yeah, sorry. I just, just wanted to say, you know, He's looked more dangerous coming on as a sub, and I think Max Meyer mentioned it earlier. Yeah, he did. Um, I just, you know, that's for me. That's his role, I think now, in, and I, I wouldn't be too keen to see him start. Bring him on, let him do what he's got to do for twenty twenty minutes or whatever, and uh, you know, maybe that's going to help us more than him starting. You know, that's, that's okay. Just... Just so you know, in, in a future episode of Kaj, like I've already thought about this, we're going to go through all the players, and I'm going to ask the question, are they a uh, starter in the Premier League, a bench player in the Premier League, or simply a championship player? So I, I thought that would be – and Cavalier was an interesting one to talk about. So definitely uh, just future episode of thinking about doing that, really just talk about all the players. But all right, guys, good stuff. Max, over to you, man of the match. Sorry about that. Yeah, I felt you know bad for Mike because – he sprung a question on him, and I was thinking, I don't have an answer for the man of the match, which tells you all you need to know about the, okay. the, the Palace game is that there's no individual person that stood out. I would agree with Anderson. I think he was probably the one you'd have to pick. You'd say him. I think Stefan said it in the comments earlier in the sense that we're asking Anderson to do it all. Yep. He's captaining the side. He's defending. We're asking him to score from corners and then score from free kicks. So it's a, it's a Joachim Anderson FC right now. Uh, but I thought I thought he was bright and – Honestly, you can make fun of the free kick. It wasn't that far wide. And no. if it's on target, that's a goal because Guaita takes a step to the wrong the wrong way. So maybe that's a bit of a, a good play in the future. But yeah, you're right. It was no individual really stood out. And, you know, it's nil-nil, so what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, very good. All right, coming up next, the second part of the show is going to be an interesting game that we're going to play. Okay, guys. As I mentioned to you guys off air, I had a little bit of surprise. And I Mike probably figured out what the surprise is because, again, Mike loves numbers. So before we do that, before we start the game, Mike, let's talk about your tweets because you actually – I thought your tweets were more positive after the match because you were talking about the upcoming matches. And that's going to lead to our game. So let's talk about your tweets after the match. 
Um, I, I'd have to go back and read them, but no, I think um, I think what you're alluding to was that um, the next yeah, rematches we, and the nine after that. Yeah. So so basically, what you got to look at is everyone's talking about what's the target. You know, what are we going to need to get exactly? And, and certainly, uh, up until about January, it was all looking around about. 34, 35, 36, somewhere around there. But now you basically have two or three teams, the two teams above and, and then Burnley as well. But the two above on a point per game. So it's very easy. 12 games out, we're going to need 38. Okay. okay. Now there's a chance one of them will drop to 36. One of them might get to 40. But the way tables work um, is it will probably end on 38 okay Okay. so so you've got to look at a point a game so the trouble is we've got 12 games we've got 21 from no we've got what we got 23 from 23 right now yeah 23 from 26 yeah so i said that what we need to do is get to parity which is a point per game as soon as we can now the fact is we're playing three of the big six coming up in a row there's a good chance that we could lose all three. We might get a win. We might get a couple of draws. But for our argument's sake, yep. just say we lose all three. Okay? So that so in at 29 games, we will be stuck on 23 points. Okay? But pretty much the table above us, they will be on 29 points. So we're still only be, we're only be six or seven behind with nine games left. And we would have played... Three of the top six, if you or three of the big three, right? Uh, things. So that's all I was sort of saying is, you, you've you've got to look at it as a, in the whole, right? Okay? We and not panic because we need arguably fifteen points from twelve games, right? And we will probably still need fifteen points from nine games, possibly. Um, but you have to weigh that up against who you're actually playing. So that's all I was sort of saying is in three games time, they're suddenly not going to be nine, 12 points clear because teams, You're trying to... points, teams come down. Yep. It's the way leagues work. And yep. uh, it's why when I do a lot of stuff, I never actually talk about the teams. I just say 18th is this. You just 17th, look at the points, 16th. right. You... Yeah, Same exactly. way around the other way. When you're going to the top, it's yep. like it's sixth place. That's what you want to go for. Don't worry about the teams because the league will sort itself out. And I've got enough data to say that's the way it works. Okay, so, excellent, excellent stuff. I so yeah, it's um, I, I, I've I've looked at a lot of stuff today, and one minute I'm up here thinking it's fairly good, <laughs> and then I look at something else and I go, oh, I know, <laughs> you know, I mean the, the one I've got, I'm stuck on now is we actually yep. need. Okay, so yep. to both of you, have we been playing well over the last twelve games? Would you say we've done all right? I would yeah. say we've we've done all right. <laughs> We've just done all right. Good, good stuff. Twelve games, right? So over that twelve <gasps> games, we've yep. done all right. The next twelve games, we've actually got to get more points than we did in the last twelve games. So you That's sort true. of go, yeah. <laughs> no, because, then because... That, but then you look at Newcastle. Yep. And they've got to play five of the bottom six, so everyone around them, you know. So they technically they've got easier games to sort of get points from. Six of our twelve games are against the big six. <laughs> so. Okay, mate. Okay, now you're depressing me. Okay. <laughs> no, listen. Wait, are you including Arsenal in the big six? Because I don't think there's <laughs> no, yeah, six yeah, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that makes things interesting because that's going to lead to our little game. And if you're watching live, feel free to play along with our little game. Here's the little game. Okay. Um, let me pull up, put up this graphic, and you guys will probably get a little chuckle on this. So let me just. Put it up here. Okay, it's Cottage Talks points prediction game. Guys, we're going to predict every one of the matches, okay? And I want you to come up with a, to- a points total at the end. So so while we go through this, we're going to go through each and every one, keep adding on. We start at 23. We're going to go to each and every match. I'm going to play along with us. I actually did this by myself. Mike, I came up with 42, believe it or not. <laughs> so, but Ross, I don't, Ross, what are you smoking? But I don't think I'll come up with 42, 42 points. Yeah, you just said, what? We're on what? 23? 21. 
went to, how many points are you? you want to double the points oh my god <laughs> okay okay but like i said i'm gonna do this fresh now so i probably won't come up with that total the magic number mike is saying is 38 let's see if we come up with 38 okay so let's start here all right mike over to you prediction for the tottenham match yeah, draw draw max yeah, I've actually done this in, in actually on my own time. Uh, independent, I had no idea because I was obsessed. So I actually have us losing the next three. So you can just put me in for zero for the next three. Um, no, I mean that, but believe me, I still have my, I still have us staying up. But we'll see. Yep. We'll see that. Okay, I'm penciling this as as an upset victory. I got, a, I got a victory here. Okay, the Liverpool match. Max, you have it as a loss. Mike, what do you have for the Liverpool? Uh, yeah, loss. Yeah. Okay, I got a draw. <laughs> As you can see, I'm already positive. Okay, Man City, I think we're all going to agree. Loss? Sure. Yeah. I mean, hey, West Brom did get a point that he had, but I okay. still think we'll All right, here's a big one, guys. Mike, to you first. Leeds United. Um, I just can't see his winning, but I'll, I'll take a draw. Okay, a draw. Max? Yeah, I agreed. Draw? I got a victory. <laughs> I guess you guys can see where this is going. Okay. Aston Villa away. Mike, over to you. Yeah, actually, I think we win that one. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a draw. Max? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Ross. I think we'll draw it. Okay. All right. All right. Wolves match at home. Guys, over to you, Mike. Uh, draw. Max? I think we'll win that. I have a win. Okay. All right, let's go further on. Ooh, the Arsenal match. Max, I'll go to you first. I, I think we'll get a point. I think we'll get a point against Arsenal. Okay, I put a point down. Mike? I uh, lost. Okay. Chelsea at Stanford Bridge. Mike? Loss. Max? Yeah, I think I think we'll lose. Okay, I'm going to put a draw. Okay. Let's go to Burnley. This is, you know, I'm putting this as a must win. I'm, I'm, I'm already saying three points against Burnley. Mike? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go with three. Okay. Max? Yeah, I think we'll win. Okay. Southampton away. Mike? Uh, now, the question is, is, is it Southampton from the last six games or will it be <laughs> Southampton in nine games when they probably, you know? I don't um, know. That's a great question. I'll go for a draw. Draw. Okay. Max? Yeah, I think we'll win this. Okay, I'm going for a draw. Okay. It's going to lead up to Manchester United, which I have as a loss. Over to you, Max. I think we'll lose that as well. Okay. Mike, yeah, anything same. from Manchester United? Yeah, full apps. <laughs> okay. All right. We end with Newcastle. Over to you. I'll give you first shot at this, Max. Yeah, I think we'll win that. So in my situation, we win three out of our last four. So okay. I think we really turn on towards the end against teams around us. Okay. Um, that's 15 points. Okay. Mike? Over to you. Uh, yeah, I think we'll win. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll win as it is. Now, if it comes down to it as being the playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, guys. Let's all do our totals. Max, what was your total? You, you said you already came up with your total. Yeah, 15. So, I think that gets us exactly to uh, 38. I know. Yep. Yep, the 38. Okay. Mike? Uh, yeah, I got 13, so I guess it's 36. And then you do get them to 43, Russ. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so, Russ, what are your losses in this? My losses are Manchester United and Manchester City. So I'm, 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 I, think, I think we can actually get points off of Chelsea and Arsenal. Those would be the games that I, I, I was kind of going back and forth yeah. on. But... I'm not that impressed with, with Chelsea, and, and I'm certainly, you know, and I, and I think we can get a point off. You know, again, these are these are neutral matches now. That's why I've kind of changed my my thinking on this. They're neutrals. So I'm, I'm thinking, why not? But, you know, you guys know I, me. I, I, I guess the better question is, like, how many do you have us winning? Because I think we, we can draw. We've shown we don't lose very many matches, but we can't win. So how many? I have us winning four. I have us winning. Four, I have us winning five. Mike, how many do you have us winning? Three. Three. Okay. It's interesting because me and Max both have us losing five and you have us losing two. Yeah. So, you know, realistically, I think me and Max are probably... Oh, you guys um, are more realistic than I am. I, no, I, no, I think we're on. just... 
maybe a, a loss too many, but then maybe a win too many as well. So I think it just comes down to it. You know, it, it is it is too close to call, as they say. Right. And it's going to be on a knife edge. And, you know, there's some really interesting six-point games between the bottom guys, you know, Newcastle. And Brighton, you know, they, they must be so demoralised from their games recently. I mean, talk about us not being able to score. <laughs> um, and we've all been focusing on Newcastle, the ones. Yeah, now, they've got a couple of really serious injuries, um, which may cause them real problems. Um, but you do wonder now with Brighton, maybe they're the team we might, you know, end up. There is a, there is, you know, there is a possibility that three of us will end up on 36, 37 points. And because of goal difference, we'll probably get away with it. That's um, right. But, you know, we're a, hard, we're a hard team to beat, but we can't score goals. So we're struggling to win games. So a point a game over the next 12, if we just need to get a couple, I need to get another couple of wins somewhere and just yeah. to get that 15. That's, um, why I, that's why I kind of threw the Tottenham match. I'm thinking like the Everton match. Now, again, I could be dead wrong on that, but. You know, and, and again, you guys know I'm, um, I'm positive. I didn't, I didn't even do my total beforehand. I just, I, I, I just did this fresh, and it's actually before I did it, I had 42, and I do it again, I have 43, which is pretty pie in the sky. I can't see that happening, but you know what? We'll see what happens, guys. Uh, but you yeah, know, I at, yeah, I, I look at it a different way, Russ. So I, I mentioned we're playing six of the, the six big teams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whether they're in the mid-table or not, it doesn't matter. But they're the six big teams. So out of those six games, if we can get a win or three draws, then you then you need 12 points from the other six games, OK? Yep. So And you look at those, and, and that makes it tough. So once you break that down, you then sort of think, well, maybe a win and a draw from those six games. So it is really knife-edge stuff. It's, yeah. it's, we haven't got much room to... Um, make too many mistakes. So going back to my tweets that you mentioned, yes, yep. we can use the next three, but it does make does make it incredibly hard if we can't pick a point up or two. So. Right. Well, Mike, you brought up a good point because out of say Newcastle, Brighton, and us, Newcastle United, you know, and again, I can't stand. I I watched that last match, but you know, there there's a common theme of not scoring goals, but Newcastle United will get Callum Wilson back, and that, and that will make a difference. Maybe you're right about Brighton, Mike, because they can't score. I think I think they're worse than us. You know, I mean, they really struggle. They, You know, it's funny. That's a team that looks like they could be a, a, a top-10 team. They just can't score goals. As Giannis said to me, it's like, what's wrong with, with Brighton? They just can't score goals. What I think gives us a chance, Mike, like you said, we need the goals to win the matches, but we'll always be in these matches because of, of the defense. So we should be in it to the end. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Then that we should be in this relegations battle until the end because of the defense. Yeah, to get us I over mean, the top, it's going to come down to the wins. Yeah, I mean, we don't look in danger of losing games an awful lot, but then we're not convincing in going to win them. So that's why I go back to. The point that, you know, over the next 12 games, yeah, we could probably get 13, 14 points maybe because that's historically the way we are and we're stuck in that gear. And, um, you know, I, I don't agree with people who say, oh, this team is a top 10 team. It, you know, it's not because it can't score goals. That's right. <laughs> so it's not. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, I do think it's just going to come really come down to that last couple of games. If we if we can get to the Newcastle games, still with a chance of of it being in our hands that we have to win a game. That's right. Or even get a draw. You know, we might be ahead of them. Who knows? Um, then that would be, you know, a brilliant achievement. Um, yeah. But I I can't see it being a situation where it's done and dusted and we're safe. I just. I just can't see how that mathematically works out for us. Okay, okay. So, so you go against the positivity of Rob and Gordon because if you saw the show, like they were, I mean, they had me all excited because they were very positive. So, you know, and as we it, said off, air, but as we said off air before we started, I try and be realistic. You know, I know, I know. You know, I I hope we are. 
Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like a nice relaxing game at the cottage <laughs> if I was able to get a ticket. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just don't see it, you know. Mike, one final topic going on, because, again, let's say it comes down to the Newcastle match. And um, let's talk about, again, if, if supporters are going to be allowed back in. Do you think that's going to be a reality? Because I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pushback. What's the latest you're hearing about that? Well, so, I mean, it does look like it would be a reality. But the, the, the situation is, and, and some people might say, oh, well, that's tough. You know, is I don't think it's fair because of the way the cutoff date is with regards when fans could be allowed in. Yep. There is a chance that the week before on game 37 or 36, whenever it is, those teams won't have a fan. So, you know, I think it's un- I do think it's unfair yeah. <laughs> for us in a, in a game which potentially, you know, is a, a decider for us to have home fans and Newcastle have, would not have had that chance in their previous home game. So right. there is talk of moving the games to get over this sort of oh. date. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, I just think it's unfair. And I know I'll get, you know, and I know some people have, I've mentioned it to people and I go, oh, we're tough, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But, <laughs> you know, in the end, you in the end, you, you've got to look at it in the whole. That's the way I look at it. It's just a bit unfair, I think. You know, we'll take a ticket. We'll take it. And uh, I think as... Um, I was going to say, Mike, are you going to say no? Obviously not. No, you're, no. You're going to be the there. Rules. You, play, you play under the rules. But, yeah, exactly. Um, honestly, I But I it is unfair, Mike. I agree with you. I wouldn't let any fans in. I would just finish the season without fans. Yeah. Because it's still May... Yes, the vaccine is is being rolled out here very quickly, but in at the end of May we're still going to be in a situation where it's still going to be restricted and you're still going to have lots of measures in place. Just why do it for that last game? Just wait until August when we're going to be in a much better position and yep. it's fair on everyone and safety wise it's fair on everyone. Okay. Um, but that's just that's just my view. So. Okay, Max, what do you make of this? Yeah, I think the proposal maybe to push, you know, the, the second to last match week to a date where it makes sense yeah. might, might be fair. At the end of the day, I, I I'm that. pessimistic that any fans will be let in at all. Uh, kind of agreeing with Mike, this virus has been so fast changing. And I remember, you know, I, I've heard all about the UK stuff when Boris said, oh, you can visit your family on Christmas. And, you know, we have variants. The, the virus changes. No one really knows what it'll look like in three months' time, whatever. And... Hopefully the vaccine route will go as well. I mean, I'm fingers crossed it works, but I've seen enough of this disease that I know there's no easy way to predict three months out what will happen. So okay. I think we might not even have to deal with this question because we might not be at that point. Okay. Um, but, but just just a point on, on the last conversation about how many points you need, et cetera. Yep. You, know, you look at Newcastle United, and I know Mike doesn't like to look at the other teams, and I respect that um, from a statistical point of view, <laughs> but as a fan, I have to look at it. So their next three, they play West Brom, Villa, Brighton, you know. So I think that's a decent opportunity to win against West Brom and perhaps win against Brighton. Of the course. Next. But they enter Poor they gonna re- play though. really tough run in. Brian down. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. But they have a really tough run in. Spurs, I think Burnley's probably the weak link there, but Spurs, Burnley, West Ham, Liverpool, Arsenal, Leicester, City. So yeah. that next seven matches, that's tough oh. for them. And then the final two is us and Sheffield United. Sheffield United, yeah. And I actually went and calculated the Newcastle points, and this probably was a bit pessimistic, but I have them getting 11 points over the run where I have us getting 15. So that has us staying up, et cetera. But it, okay. it, it just goes to show that you know, Newcastle don't have an easy run either. No. And about, I do want to temper that analysis by saying if you watch the Wolves match, they weren't nearly as bad as everyone you know, made them out to be. Newcastle no, they, actually, is, they actually played well. Yeah. And I, I think I, we have to remember that. Credit. We, we focus on them as a bogey team and maybe Brighton too, but I think they're still streetwise Premier League clubs with a lot of quality in them. And I know Newcastle hit hard by injuries, and that's why I have some hope. But That's a big deal though, Max. We can't, just expect, we can't just expect <laughs> them to roll over no. in the run-in. And I think their wins against Everton, uh, they want to go to some park as well, yep. um, and they beat Southampton. It shows that they kind of have that winning mentality in a way that it would be unlikely for them just, just to lose so many in a row. But I'm, I'm hoping they fall apart. I think they're going to fa- be faced with injuries. That's big. I think Sam Maximin yep. might be out. You know, we obviously know Cal Wilson's out. 
But as Mike mentioned, you know, Brighton can get sucked into it. And when the teams around us play each other, on one hand, yes, it's good for you know a team like Newcastle, but it means that they can't all win. They that's both right. can't win matches. So I, that's it, right. that's it's one way to look at it. Yeah. Um, I, I think Mike had the best point in the sense And that, that goes to Mike's point it's that it's, it's not going to be like nine points, Mike. It's going to be like six, even if we lose all three. Yeah, I mean, it's um, don't underestimate. Um, we all underestimate Bruce, and we can all laugh at him, but he's an experienced manager. As I mentioned, five of their games are against the teams at the bottom. Yes, they've got those other hard runs, just as uh, just as we have as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, he knows how to play against us, and he knows how to play against those other teams at the bottom. And as a Newcastle, if, if you're a Newcastle fan, you're looking at those five games in your game. I mean, what do we need from that? You know, you're not ideally 10, but probably if you can get seven from those five games, you know, that's uh, and then pick up a three points in one of those other odd ones. You know, you, you're almost there. But I think you're really, you know, 11 from their last 12 or 10 from their last is a realistic figure for Newcastle. So, again, so it's right on the edge. Mark. It's six points. Yeah, exactly. It's, right on the edge. It's that win here. It's that last minute winner they get against Brighton or, or whatever that's going to flip it, you know. Yeah. It is. It's going to yeah. come down to the end, but that that's what made this uh, exercise interesting. Even though I was kind of the outlier with my my total there, but you know, it was interesting to see both of your totals because you guys are more realistic than I am. I'm, I'm uh, way too much positivity. I'll be the first to admit it. But that's just how I roll. Anyways, great show. Before we go, Mike, final thoughts on the show before we wrap this up. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, um, considering it was probably the most boring game to watch all season. But that's why I, I came up with, a, a with this show. game. Yeah, no, it was a good show. Really enjoyed it, and um, it's uh, there are positives to take. You know, we are we are playing well, and um, or, or certainly in certain ways we're playing well, and our, our points should be a bit higher than it has been, but we've just got to find a way to, to score a goal. We're... Somebody's going to get beat. I don't think somebody's going to get beat well. I don't think it's going to be in the next three games. <laughs> but no. Before the end of the season, we're going to see us get three or four, I'm sure. Okay. Max, final thoughts before we go. I like that optimism from Mike there. Yeah, I know it's actually there. making me feel much better. But it's funny because I, I just <laughs> seem so outlandish. And I, I know we got three against Leeds and a loss, but I think that's the highest we got all season. So it's amazing to think we get three in one match. Um, but one final thought I want to say is that yeah, I think on. all of us have us beating Newcastle in the final of the season. I think Russ, in your scenario, we'd already be well clear, so it might oh, matter yeah. less. Oh, yeah. But oh, in, in, in Mike and I's prediction, what worries me, and, and this might be getting a bit too ahead of myself, but I'll go there, is if Newcastle are ahead of us, right? It could be one point, could be three points, whatever. All they'll need to do is just play for the draw, and we'll need to win. And what worries me is they'll just set up shop and knowing our weaknesses of breaking teams down, it could be just such a nerve-wracking, frustrating match. But, you know, we're not there yet. That's many, many months. I, wanna be, I, I would yeah. like to be in that situation regardless. I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Based on what we've watched, can Fulham break down a team like that? Well, we'll have to see. But I'd like them to be in the situation or better to, to do that. And my final thought involves this, guys. We really haven't talked about this. But goal differential could play a factor here. Goal differential. And... Newcastle United, you know, and again, there's a there's some decent space there. So again, just don't sleep on goal differential. I and mean, like as Mike said, listen, if if we beat someone fairly well, that's going I think going to increase the goal differential. So that's something to consider if it comes down to that final match. But in my scenario, it's not going to come down to that final match, guys. Anyways, <laughs> all right, great show. But it is time to wrap up this episode. I do want to mention. I do want to mention this, Mr. Cohen. We're going to be doing. Cohen Squared Show. Yes, we're going to be doing a special show with – it's going to be Wonder Twins. It's going to be Max and his twin sister it's going to be doing a show with me. That should be a lot of fun. I look forward to that, Max. Are you looking forward to that? Yeah, it'll be good. You know, my twin sister, Rachel. Russ yeah. just found out. I thought I told him earlier, but he just found out last week that I have a twin sister who's a massive home know. supporter as well. She always listens or she says she listens to the podcast, but she watches every match. And uh, hopefully okay. we'll get, we'll get a, a, a good show in soon. Yeah, that should be fun. Uh, that should be a fun show to do, and uh, I'll just uh, basically step away and just let the Coens go at it. So that, <laughs> that that should be fun. But anyways, let's wrap up the show. For Max Cohen and Mike Gregg, I'm Russ Goldman. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening to Cottage Talk.